action. So of course I, I think that that aspect of sustainability, as much as sustainability we like to say it's quite an overused word these yes, days, true. Um, but I don't think that matters. It's still of fundamental importance. We, we do need to produce food and take care of the environment. And if we're not doing both of those things, you know, there's an imbalance there and it's not going to be a long-term option. And of course, we have to be doing that within an economic sustainability. That's that triple P. That's right. And so we've also got to be taking care of the people, the social dimensions, but also the profit um, and also the environment. Welcome so, everybody to the Sarah Machinery Podcast. Uh, I'm here uh, today as part of the Vic No-Till Conference that we're attending. Uh, Paul aside, Joel Williams, one of the key speakers. Uh, very, very uh, appreciative of your time, mate. I know you're busy and you, we've got another uh, another bit of a talk this afternoon. Mm. Um, but, yeah, while we're here, thank you very much for your time, mate. Pleasure. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for having me. Uh, my pleasure, mate. Um, so just a bit about yourself, Joel, your business. Mm, yeah. Would you like to explain to sure. anybody out there in the in the Twitter in the uh, podcast world that <laughs> doesn't understand uh, who you are, because most of the people here have uh, at the Vic No Chill Conference know you from a long, long uh, sort of association with mm. uh, yeah. the the, the uh, conferences that you've been attending to, and and your master classes and the crop tours and all that sort of stuff. But uh, yeah, just tell us a bit about yourself from, in regards to your business, and uh, then we'll talk a bit about your history. Mm, sure. Yeah. So. I, my business is called Integrated Soils and I'm an independent plant soil health educator. So I pretty much just provide information, um, do education, run workshops, speak at conferences, all of that kind of thing uh, for primarily for farmers. Yep. Um, so I have a particular interest in, you know, I like to keep up with some of the latest soil science and plant soil science. And uh, I really appreciate um, that farmers are busy people. They don't always have a lot of time for digging in and reading things or the inclination to, to maybe read some of the academic papers, which yep. can be a bit heavy. Um, and so uh, that's kind of where I um, have specialized is really um, take, translating some of that science, some of the interesting things happening in the plant and soil health space yep. and really translating that in, a, in through educational workshops and seminars and things to help farmers kind of keep abreast of, of some of the really good science that's happening out there at the moment. Yep. So playing a bit of a conduit between mm. the academic world and the practical world because I that's, think that's one of your big strengths is being right. able to explain it to, to farmers. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, universities used to have extension agents that kind of did this and that was yep. something over the last quite a few decades that has kind of dwindled, um, funding being cuts and that kind of thing. So, yep. um, so in a way, yeah, I just that, that became um, um, by default something that I kind of just fell into. I, yep. I've always been passionate also about education and the role of education in helping driving change. And so, um, uh, so, yeah, over time it started becoming more and more of that, particularly taking some of the academic information and translate extension and translating that for farmers. Yeah. Because there is some pretty exciting stuff, as you've been mentioning today, and and mm. uh, in regards to the to soil science, um, but yeah, how it can be worked in a practical manner is probably one of the big hesitations. I think a lot of farmers, because if you don't understand it, you tend to shy away. So I think what you're doing, your work is is really critical. Um, yeah. So yeah. Brisbane boy originally. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Grew up born and raised in Brisbane and um, studied uh, agricultural science there at UQ. I yep. had a keen interest in uh, soil science uh, since the beginning there, yep. uh, all that time. Uh, back when soils weren't wasn't quite such a hot topic as they are today. <laughs> well, they are now. Twenty odd years later, very much. It's so, always yeah. interesting to see the change. But yep. um, so uh, yeah, more of a background in soil chemistry, mineral balancing, plant nutrition, uh, foliar feeding, that kind of thing. And um, yeah, then life took me to the UK. Um, like a lot, like a lot of Aussies do for a few years, but um, I ended up staying there for ten years. Nice. Um, and uh, over there, I um, yeah, I was working all around Europe, um, particularly then in the soil biology space. So working with biofertilizers and microbials, understanding of the biological aspects to soil health. Yep. And uh, these days, I kind of integrate those two worlds together. But um, so yeah, spent a lot of time in Europe and um, worked a lot with a whole range of different farmers there, but particularly more. Um, broad acre crops and cropping and, uh, and some grassland context. Yep. And, uh, and then, yeah, seven years ago, I moved to Canada. I've been based there ever since. Um, that's kind of since when I pretty much launched Integrated Soils and started doing this as my full-time job, pro yep. profession, and um, <clears throat> providing this yeah, independent education. So now because of that kind of nomadic background there, I'm 
very lucky to have a bit of a following in um, Australia, Europe, and, and North America, and that's kind of the three areas where I yep. do most of my work. Yep. Um, but to be fair, I've become, I guess, a lot more well-known since leaving Australia, so uh, it's, fu <laughs> it's funny for me to return. Get you to come back and... Yeah, yeah, there's many people here, I think, that still haven't come across me, which is, you know, all good, whatever, yep. but is what it is. But, um, yeah, I think uh, I have a bit of a bit of a... a bit of a stronger following maybe in the northern hemisphere but but, but but the last few years i've been coming back here now to australia with with people like vic notil yep. who've invited i think this is the third time they've invited me back to do some some events with them yep and i've uh, written a few articles for their magazine and that kind of thing so so yeah just in the last five or so years it seems like i've been coming more and more back in reconnecting with australia which has been great very good yeah. you're over there flying the flag for the australians that's I love right it. yes very good <laughs> um on that can you explain to me some of the, the similarities between what you see in Canada from from where the industry is at in regards to soil health mm. and maybe Europe as well? Just a bit of a bit of a because a lot of people love being able to compare what mm. Aussies are doing. I think we're leading the way, but is that true? <laughs> no, <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good question. <laughs> yeah, I think in some areas. So yeah, that, that's a great question, and I think um, there's kind of many ways to answer it. I guess on one hand, I would say that. There's a lot of similarities, I would say, between no matter yep. Europe, Canada, or you know North America, Australia, in terms of things, topics that farmers are interested in learning yep. more about, challenges that they're facing. Um, they, I would say there's a total commonality. They want to know how to reduce inputs, improve efficiencies. They want to know how to improve soil health, how to get more with less, be more efficient, um, optimize, reduce pesticides, optimize plant health. You know all of those things. Um, those are universal interests yep. that are totally okay applicable around around those contexts. But okay, the context in which then we the strategies that we yeah, deploy, that that's where you know maybe that that gets a little bit different there. Um, but I would say it's quite universal at the moment. And then sure, there are differences, of course, between different countries. And I would say then it really depends on what aspects that you're interested in as to who's kind of leading. Yep. So I do think that Australia um, is definitely one of the leaders for sure, but especially in regards to the conversations around soil carbon, yep. uh, carbon farming, carbon markets, soil carbon. I think Australia has um, definitely, that conversation has been on the table for a lot longer here. Yep. And so it's a lot more um, mainstream and, and, and universally talked about. Sure, our government-approved system, the ACUs and things, that helps, uh, I think, um, also advance that, that, that discussion. So I think Australia is doing some very interesting work in that space. But, you know, in other countries, yeah, they have other strengths. You know, I think US is pretty good, doing some really good stuff on the cover cropping yep. kind of space. Canada, I think, is definitely one of the leaders in things like intercropping and companion yep. cropping. I think they're doing some really great stuff there, uh, particularly on the prairies and um, – and then, you know, UK, Europe is doing some kind of good work in terms of, you know, reducing pesticides, input efficiencies, yep. some of the other um, um, uh, su some of the other strategies to support um, some of the wider ecology, you know, bringing a bit of ecology into the agronomy. So yep. managing buffer zones, shelter belts, you know, flower strips, some of this ecological infrastructure to integrate yep. um, better e uh, landscape health, landscape function, not just you know, within the on productive an areas and yeah. on farms, but also um, more wider speaking ecologically. I think there's some good things happening in, in Europe in that in that space as well. So, yeah, so it kind of depends where you are and yep. what, what the angle is. I thought that would have been the case. With the um, with things like uh, some of the, the challenges that they're facing in regards to uh, incorporating, well, getting the word out, I should say, do they have grower groups and things like that? Uh, like we have here oh absolutely they do yeah absolutely yeah and i think this is one of the also one of the unifying features of this uh kind of soil health movement is yep. that it has become quite a a bottom-up approach um a, a groundswell of a movement yep and uh, the, the key driver of that has indeed been uh farmers helping farmers yep farmer networking farmer cluster groups uh, sure, social media has played its role, its its role in that in that um, advancement as well. So I think that it's a, a big part of it that farmers are really interested in being more efficient, using less inputs, being more sustainable. Yep. And there's a lot of experimentation happening out there. Of course, all farmers experiment, try things. Yep. And so there's a lot of valuable anecdotes and valuable information there that 
um, if not shared, is just learnt for one, you sure. know. So as soon as farmers start sharing and um, bringing all of those individual learnings together, there's huge opportunity to really advance the 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 awareness and the pra- and the the community of practice accordingly, you yep. know, much more infinitely, you know. And that's what's really happened, I think, with this soil health um, general discussions. It's been very much grassroots, bottom up movement that has been key to its success. I would say key to its strength and success in terms of um, being able to cast that net wide and engage with many different farmers and really bring together these various innovative practices and um, the important practical aspects to their successful adoption yep. and uh, sharing that knowledge and uh, and also, you know, learning from farmers on the other side of the world too. I mean, I, I know that, again, the context is so different. Sometimes it's true. Ad, but sometimes there's a lot of overlap, I think. And yep. um, sure, you might have to tweak and fine-tune the context depending. But, um, but you know, again, things like social media, giving us that opportunity to follow yep. farmers on the other side of the world and learn from other farmers, et cetera, has been hugely valuable. Yep. So when you talk about um, things that we can learn from other farmers and other farmers over overseas, where do you see would be the top two things that the Australian uh, agricultural landscape could benefit by looking at other 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 markets? Mm, mm, you okay. touched on the the intercropping and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah. So yeah, let's go with that one. This this point about. Um, diversity. So yep. one of the interesting things happening in certainly in the UK, uh, it's also happening in Canada too, but I think UK is really well adopted is this idea of variety blends yep. uh, where farmers will mix together three or four different varieties of that same plant species and particularly wheat is a is a main example over there. Yep. Um, and they're seeing a lot of benefits in terms particularly around um, less disease pressure yep. um, and that's paying dividends in terms of less fungicide use. So that little bit of diversity in terms of genetic diversity, still all wheat plants, but just mixed varieties can really improve the tolerance and the resistance of that system against, um, against, for example, pathogens. And it's really nothing fancy about that. It's really quite straightforward that, you know, when we plant a monoculture of the same species and the same variety, yep. if that variety is susceptible to a particular disease, uh, and therefore if one plant is susceptible, then all of the plants are susceptible because they're all uniform. Yep. So by breaking that up with a little bit of genetic diversity through different varieties, some of those may have you know different varying levels of resistance, but all of that ultimately means that that can really slow down the ferociousness of that spread, slow yep. down that spread, um, slow down the intensity of that potential um, pathogen infection. So I think that's one of the examples that's um, having good impact quite into also quite mainstream farmers are really adopting that. Yep. Uh, I think that's one that, that farmers could. Because it is could, one of those things that can be implemented without too many changes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. See, the, in terms of then the machinery angle, it's all still wheat seed. They're all still the same. Yep. They've all got still the same flowability, et cetera. So, um, so that I think is definitely one of the low-hanging fruit that um, I think more farmers here could Yep. Um, could get on board with and and the next step to that would be then the more species diversity so mixing different species yep. in the field together so here we're talking about intercropping or companion cropping yep uh, bringing two or more two or more different plant species what were some together. of the examples you gave today because there was some really good uh, sort of mustards mm, that's right yeah so i mean the classic one that's been around for a long time is is the peola peas and, and canola yep but you know one of the other classics is also peas and oats you know a lot of our grandfathers and forefathers and whatnot uh, used to grow uh, a lot of these this kind of combination well peas and oats or peas peas and barley yep um so there's there's quite a few kind of classic combinations out there um again in the uk i'd say there's also good intercropping happening um, yep. with wheat and beans seems to be a good one um and uh and then yeah peas and oats or peas and canola yep so this and there's plenty i mean really it's limited but only by your imagination there's, so, well that's that's there's, the thing, isn't it? there's many other combinations yep. i mean one of the big ones in canada is um that's become also very well known is chickpea and flax and oh. and again the big benefit that they're seeing to that is disease protection, yep. disease suppression, because chickpeas are quite a, a disease-prone crop. And by actually putting um, a flax population in there, there's definitely some interactions and some effects there in terms of reducing the susceptibility of those chickpeas to disease. Yep. So so Canada, I think, has become um, yeah, a bit of a shining light in terms of some really good adoption at scale. Yep. Because, you know, on the prairies there, their scale is very similar to here in Australia. Yep. And to be honest, you know, their moisture situation is not so dissimilar either. 
they have the advantage of some snow and then that snow melt gives them good spring moisture to start off with for it. establishment. But after that, the growing season on the Prairie Canada is pretty dry. Yep. It's really not that dissimilar to here because um, the one of the barriers I hear a lot here in Australia amongst Australian farmers is, oh, we don't have the moisture to take two crops through yep. to, to, to the combine. Um, but that's not the right view, way to view it because you're not plant necessarily Okay, there's different ways to do this, but you're not necessarily planting those plants, the two plants, the two species at full seeding rates. Yep. You're going to adjust the seeding rates back. Uh, so, for example, you know, you might be using 50% of each of them. I mean, again, there's different ways to how you can approach this, but just as an 100%, example. 100%, that's right. Um, that's right. So, if you're, if, you're, if you're reducing your seeding rate by 50% of the two mixes, well, the impact of that then on water usage, et cetera, water use efficiencies is not necessarily such a big concern that many think it is. You're going to adjust your seeding rates to compensate yep. for the moisture you have. And that's part of, okay, that's part of the practical uh, and experiential learning that definitely we need to fine tune in the Australian landscape. Yep. Um, but so I would say that the, yeah, their moisture situation, I know some farmers in parts of the prairies, they're, they're, it's not uncommon to be on six to eight, 10 inches of rainfall. It's pretty low rainfall, you know, yep. and they're making it work, you know. Yep. Um, so I think that's a real opportunity for also for Australia is some of this companion and, and intercropping to grow two species together. And, you know, despite the fact that after you combine, you'll have uh, in the bin there two different mixes, then there's a whole associated hassle and barrier of separation yep. equipment for that a labor to do that yes it is a genuine barrier but it's not insurmountable and i think the canadian prairie farmers have proved that at the very similar scale to here yep. that they are making it work and and do that and what they find is that the benefits that they see in field to that extra diversity um, far exceeds the associated costs and labor associated with the separation. So many of them are seeing, again, um, improvements, reductions in fertilizer use, reductions yep. in fungicide use. And so the cost savings there are definitely um, offsetting the associated labor and post-harvest separations. So. Well, it doesn't matter where you go, uh, every input, whether it's at the grocery store, whether it's at the hardware store, whether it's where you get your chemicals from, everything is going up. So the more we can reduce that, the better chance that we're going to be able to have a better business case That's right. to make it a bit bit more viable because it's, it's very, very at forefront to be able to reduce our inputs. That's right, yeah. So you're saying England's doing, oh, the UK is and, and Europe is doing that pretty well? Yeah, they're doing good stuff too. You know, they've got obviously a lot more restrictions around the pesticide use. And That's that, right. And that poses challenges, yep. you know. Um, they've got very ambitious goals and targets to reduce those. And, yeah, look, I'm not going to lie. There's going to be some, um, there's going to be a, some challenges and a bit of a bumpy transition through that. Yep. But but I would say what I've noticed um, since a, a, a bit of a stronger push with some policy announcements around that, the Green New Deal, they call it, but I've seen a, a really interesting flush of academic papers and studies looking at adding biostimulants to pesticides, for example, yep. to improve the efficiency of them and therefore to reduce the need for them, Re you know, at least stepping stone in terms of reducing the amounts needed by improving the optimization and the efficiency of Getting them to work those. more efficiently, that's spot right. Spot on, yeah. spot on. So I would say that, you know, it's this chicken of the egg, chicken and the egg thing needs yeah, must. Right. With the policy announcement, okay, there's a lot of concern amongst farmers and rightly so, no, no one wants tools taken away from them that they're dependent on, but providing there is the right some package of support yep. and research, et cetera, to help farmers with that transition. Um, we're not going to make that transition without a bit of a nudge. Almost a so, bit. That's right. Just giving them that bit of a push. To, that's that's bit right. Bit of an incentive. You've got to do it. That's yeah. right. So I've, I've noticed there's a handful of papers and there's more coming out on um, looking at now better ways to use pesticides more effectively so that we can have those com conversations more safely yep. in terms of lower risk to the business um, about step, stepping stones and strategies to, to dial down and, and again, incre just incrementally reduce some of those inputs through better enhancement of them. Yep. Recently, I did a, a, a TED talk uh, okay. and, and during my TED talk was about uh, customising solutions, looking mm -hmm. at and listening to people's needs and then customising a solution to get a better outcome. That was what my, my talk was about. Mm. Um, everything you're saying now mm -hmm. resonates uh, a big part because there's a lot of things we can learn, but we still need to be able to bring that back and utilise that, uh, that those learnings here in Australia for, for our conditions. Yeah, we, and I think that's where 
your sort of uh, benefit is from a practical point and being able to look at the, th the three main areas and combining some of those, but utilising what we do here over on the prairies and, and vice versa. I think that's uh, it's pretty special because there's not too many other, other people out there doing a similar sort of thing. I, yeah, I guess not. I mean, yeah, sure. There, there's a, <laughs> there's a that's handful why you of other. Getting, getting uh, yeah, it's true. To come back. True. No, I mean, there's a handful of other. Uh, I guess peers like myself, um, soils, or other specialists, um, yep. educators who are travelling around and and doing a bit of this. But you're right. It's a pretty small. But bringing pool it of back to a practical practical application well, is a big part. That's right, and that is, uh, of course, I mean, that is a critical piece. It's yep. it's all good to have the science and the theory and the principles and the ideas, but, you know, where the rubber hits the road is is where it is, is most important. And, yeah, you've, you've got to have that practical angle. You've got to be able to translate it into meaningful action yep. um, that is tangible and practically able to be implemented at, at scale. And um, So that's sure. probably where it leads into to my main interest, machinery mm. how where do you see that we are lacking here particularly in australia what are we lacking what do we need to focus on mm. um going forward to be able to to implement some of these things mm. like you were saying with you know with the combine the harvester we're harvesting two uh, types of grain and being able to separate yeah. and clean those and have them you know uh at a, at a scalable uh, point yes um where do you see some of the challenges mm. Yeah, sure. I mean, that would be a pretty impressive piece of kit to um, combine some intercrops and separate them right there and then. Well, uh, that's and right. falling into, Are you hearing into... that, Mr. John Deere and Pace and, and uh, Fent? Yeah, split your bins in two and have one, two halves, two different grains going in. I mean, that would be pretty impressive. Uh, I'm not a machinery man, so I don't know how realistic that goal is. But that sounds pretty cool. It does. Um, so something like that would be pretty impressive. Um, but... Uh, but beyond that, yeah, I think um, because the, the again that intercropping point is that sometimes those different plant species need to be um, drilled at different depths, yep. you know, um, different seeding conditions. So having the right equipment that can, for example, ha have two separate seed boxes and, and two separate rows yep. for kind of an alternate row intercrop, there can be a lot of benefits to that. And you know, again, that's not too difficult, but um, certainly. But I think there's some opportunities about. Um, yeah, fine tuning kind of that process, and um, so getting the right drills to to do the job initially. Um, and I think that um, the other one that I'm generally quite keen on is a lot of liquid inject. And I know I would I would consider Australia to be probably actually quite one of the leaders of some of the liquid technology. Yep. Uh, actually, um, so I think that's one of your other strengths that's happening here. But I think there's a lot of room for improvement in terms of um, dealing with some of the, because I, I, you know, I work in a lot of the biologicals and biostimulant type spaces, and there's some very interesting and innovative opportunities in that direction too, particularly in relation to using those as transition tools and substitution tools for some of our fertilizers or pesticides, or to enhance efficiency enhancers to as support in, them. As in starter fertilizer, that, that type of thing. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Um, but some of those biostimulant type products can have some hassle, practical hassles with, you know, particle size and, yep. e you know, even distribution and, and filtering and that kind of thing. So um, I think refinements in that area to um, uh, having equipment that could deal with a bit more thicker, less filtered materials yep. um, could be a real advantage um, as well. Where there's a will, there's a way. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And you know, again, similarly with some of the biologicals and microbials and things, we we kind of want to filter them as least as possible. So yep. having more coarse um, no, nozzle uh, in nozzles and orifices and pipes and things to to and then maintaining the flowability of those types of inputs, I think, would be some really good opportunities as well. Yeah, because mm. that's one of the the aims of this podcast is to be able to to have these discussions to bring together. The soil scientists, the machinery manufacturers, all of these, do, and the end user, and and you know, we all want to grow better crops. We all want to have a sustainable future for our kids. We all, we all want to be able to feed the world. So these are all things that you know we're trying to bring together. And um, I'm really interested in in that sort of thing where I say, what's been done about it? Where where does the where does the hurdles lie now? Are we uh, are there manufacturers out there that are talking to people like you to say, okay, well, if this is where we're headed. 
what do we need to do? Mm. Because I, I see talking to you know Vic Notil and, and being a part of this for as long as we have been, even though we've had a couple of years away, um, it's amazing to see some of the changes that potentially could come through. But then I see it as, well, how can we make that uh, viable from uh, a machinery point mm, yeah. and from a business point? And I think there's mm. uh, there's a lot more discussions we need to have um, as as an industry. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I would agree for sure. Um, one of the, the questions I've got then uh, for you, we won't keep too much more of your time because you've been talking a hell of a lot today. <laughs> I have, yeah. And you're on your, the, the back end of a five-week uh, five tour now. Yeah. yeah. Um, agriculture in general, mm. how do you see it? Do you see it as a, as a strong uh, industry that's going forward? Do you see we're, we're getting hampered by certain industries, other industries? Um, and I, I, where I'm sort of aiming at is I'd like to know what we're like in Australia compared to our overseas counterparts mm. um, because I see Australian agriculture as we are pretty robust. We've got some challenges, but, yeah. but we're making some great like he headway with water usage, being able to grow better crops with less and trying to remain viable. Mm. Mm. Is that a common mm. theme right across the world? Yeah, I'm assuming it would be. Yeah, I think so. I I, uh, I think agriculture on the whole, I totally agree. I think agriculture is in a very good position um, moving forward into the next decades. I and I know we have a lot of conversations about changing and and very and erratic, you know, weather and climate. And I think this will be um, one of those big challenges. Yeah. Uh, for of course, we're very much dependent on um, the weather and the rainfall and the temperatures and everything that govern plant growth. And so. That is uh, one of our vulnerabilities, but that's the way it's been forever, you know. And that's I think exactly Australia's right. of Australian farming systems have developed um, a lot of great innovation uh, to support that resilience in particularly one of the most difficult climates in the world, yep. you know, undoubtedly. So, um, but beyond that, I think that um, you know people need to eat, and that there is a lot of opportunity there for um, ag the agriculture industry at large to to meet the demands of the growing population. Uh, of course, what we do need to focus on is the sustainability of that and still producing food whilst also taking care of the landscapes and the surrounding ecology in which our farms sit, yep. in which our farms are dependent on some of those ecosystem services um, that we need for production. So, of course, I, I think that that aspect of sustainability, as much as sustainability, we like to say it's quite an overused word these <laughs> days. It's <laughs> true. Um, but I don't think that matters. It's still of fundamental importance. We, yep. we do need to produce food and take care of the environment. And if we're not doing both of those things, you know, there's an imbalance there and it's not going to be a long-term option. And, of course, we have to be doing that within an economic sustainability. That's that triple P. That's right. And so we've also got to be taking care of the people, the social dimensions, but also the profit um, and also the environment. So I... I know that sustainability has become a bit overused, but actually there's a really good foundation to that idea of that triple bottom line um, that I think will actually stand the test of time yep. and it, it will kind of come back into into fashion um, once again. Once again. <laughs> you know, e even if, you know, we talk about regenerative agriculture these days, that, well, what's yep. the point of sustaining, you know, a degraded system or a not, not truly healthy or functional optimised system? And I think there's a fair comment there that, sure, maybe there's a need for some level of regeneration and we do need to restore and improve things. Yep. I think that's a fair comment. But even if we do that uh, and restore and repair soils or society systems, whichever dimension you want to kind of think about there, uh, there will come a time where we then need to sustain that, you know, once we've done the regeneration, so to speak. So I don't... I don't um, uh, yeah, I don't look down on sustainability at all. I think it's still it will come back into vogue um, in due course. But um, but I do think that is one of our challenges is that I think that we are poised. We have great market opportunities as a growing population. Yep. Uh, we just really need to make sure that we can do more with less, be more efficient with what we do. Yep. Uh, you know, dial down on some of those inputs, minimise some of the losses into the environments. Uh, and there's opportunities around food quality. You know, improving the nutrient value of the food, and that's. One of the talks we're going to talk about here and Absolutely. today at the and conference. That's, that's some of the, the things that I think a lot of people end up forgetting is that at the end of the day, we're trying to grow not only better, bigger crops, but more healthier crops. That's right. Yeah. 
Um, I was mentioning before, my brother did, uh, I think it was 18 months in Germany as a, as a baking uh, at a university there. Oh, yeah. Um, and looking at the different flowers that they utilise, some of the old style <laughs> grains that they use, yeah. he said not only does the bread taste better, it's completely different to bake with, yep. but the nutritional value of it is yes. so much better. And for people that you know have some intolerances to what we call bread here in Australia, mm. he goes, "We've got a lot to learn about oh, yeah. about that." It's crazy. Absolutely, absolutely, I agree. Yeah, there's some great examples of really that happening to yeah infinite level of detail. There's a great project in the US called Grain Lab, and there's a yep. UK Grain Lab, and that's that's really what they're doing is really being hyper specific about the different varieties. And their end use, yep. their end application for different yeah, breads or yep. you know, different food products and really tailoring specific nutritional properties <clears throat> of the different varieties yep. um, to those end uses. And I think that's a really nice, a really extreme and really fine-tuned example <laughs> of that, which is, I think right. is, is really interesting. And um, yeah, you're right. You know, uh, some of those older varieties, they often do have, can have better baking qualities mm. and whatnot. And that's actually what we'll be talking about in my presentation later this afternoon. We'll also be looking at the nutrient density changes. Sorry about trying to steal your thunder on that. No, no. Well, people, <laughs> this will go out, I'm sure, after, yeah. uh, after uh, yeah, unless you'll, this is you'll, live. No, no, no. You'll get, you'll get the first <laughs> whack at it. Yeah. So, no, it's okay. Um, yeah, so uh, along those lines, we've also seen there has been these declines in nutrient value. Yep. Um, since, pretty much since the Green Revolution, since our, those high yielding varieties, because they're high yielding, we've been actually just diluting some of the nutritional value. Yeah. Um, so it has been a bit of a consequence of breeding uh, very focused on yield. It has come at a trade off to the some of the nutrient uptake. Yeah. Um, so, but so there is a, nonetheless there is opportunities there. To go back because we can see that it is genetically controlled some of that nutrient uptake yep. so there is opportunities to also breed for nutritional outcomes and yield you know yep. co co benefits why we don't have to breed just for one goal yep. so how do we breed for optimizing production and quality and you know that just needs to be a research agenda uh, a breeding goal which it traditionally wasn't yeah so i think now that we see these trends and we see changes and i'll be sharing a review of um uh, so many of the studies that that all point to the same direction yep. that really the nutrient has been declining since the green revolution i think a lot so, of people will agree yeah oh yeah yeah what a lot of studies your vegetable this. garden if you yeah. you put good good fertilizer and you look after that it tastes so much better than what you get from the yeah, supermarket well, anyway. That so too, that too. It's yeah. uh, going to be a lot lot better for you. Exactly, exactly. Um, so. very, yeah, the theme of uh, this conference mm. is food for thought. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, and going back to that's what we're, we're doing, we're feeding the world. Um, it was very interesting some of the points that they made about how variety of products that we actually consume as, as particularly the Westerners. Mm. Um, do you see that changing? Yeah, sure. I think that um, on the whole, uh, not everybody, of course, but on the whole, yeah, a lot of consumers are becoming more aware and conscious of their health, their yep. diet, um, those other lifestyle factors. And uh, so I do think that there's, there is a lot of traction into to health, nutrition, lifestyle, and just, just look at the number of you know, influences that are out there right. in their various little schools of thought and yep. their various little specializations kind of promoting this in one way or another. Um, and I think that just look at the number of followers. You know, there are a lot of people who are looking for information on how to be better, uh, how, how to be healthier themselves, be yeah. that with more exercise and fitness or with better dietary choices. And so... Or a big uh, combination of all of uh, it. Well, of course, absolutely, yeah. uh, indeed. And that's <clears throat> that's also important. So so I do think generally there is that that trend in, in greater interest uh, yep. amongst consumers uh in their in their health and their lifestyles and and of course the sustainability of those products in terms of their sourcing and some of that um that the various kind of value chains and sourcing and uh, of those products as well um so i think there is a greater awareness around that and you know of course we have this <clears throat> the tricky there uh, balance which we have to strike in terms of premium food products and the price and we have cost of living crises right. etc happening now and you know, you know, sure, premium food is not necessarily, may not be accessible for everybody uh, under the current way in which, um, you know, some of these things are managed. But I think that's obviously something that needs to change. You know, food, uh, food quality, food access, food security, this, 
this should be a fundamental right for all people. And um, so we do need to have those bigger conversations about well, how do we do better with all of agriculture so that we yep. lift the standard, we rif- uh, raise the standard of that nutritional value of all uh, agricultural produce to help all people as well. So. I think a lot of it's got to come back to an education point. Mm, yep. Education, we've got to educate the end user and particularly our city counterparts mm. to understand a bit more about what we're actually trying to achieve and and if we get the masses all asking for the same thing and everybody pushing towards the same goal, then some, I'm hoping that that's achievable. And mm. yep. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's going to take time. Oh, it will. But I will. But the more and more uh, we get people like yourself and uh, spreading the good word and uh, you know coming on our podcast and helping, mm. um, I'm hoping that eventually, yeah, we'll get to that point where, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the word gets out there and everybody starts pushing towards the same goal because – at the end of the day, everybody's affected by agriculture, whether you like it or not. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you very much for your time, mate. There's probably a thousand other things that we could talk yeah. about. Jump on uh, integratedsoils.com. Uh, yep. um, I had a bit of a read-up uh, yesterday before I got here. And, uh, yeah, very interesting stuff. Um, I love the fact that it's it's not just a science based but it's also coming from a practical point. And it's also sharing information between countries that have got similar similar uh, issues, but also similar similar uh, champions that we're, we're winning on some fronts too. So, yeah, excellent. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks very much for your time. Uh, as always, like and subscribe. This helps get the word out there. Um, and like I said, jump on uh, Joel's uh, website, and uh, yeah, we'll call it a day. Thank you very much.